Now we'll move on to the final part of lecture five um, on survey design. Uh, looking first at the issues of misreports. So this is the, an issue where, in essence, we can think about um, people who report what they really believe or what they say they believe or what they say they have done, um, and they have reported this incorrectly. So with behaviors or sort of fact-like <laughs> Uh, statements like, did you vote? Um, did you uh, donate money to charity? Um, do you attend church regularly? You could imagine that these are potentially observable, right? The same with income. Uh, because in essence, you can go and check out concurrent or criterion validity, so you can actually go and find some gold standard like um, IRS tax returns. However, if people apply on their tax returns, we have a bit of an issue, just like if sometimes voting reports are perfect. But you could imagine there, in theory, being a somewhat more reliable standard against which we could um, compare these, and we could talk about something like a misreport. Now, of course, with misreports of attitudes, this is much harder to assess. So we've already explored the issue of what if people say one thing, like, I don't believe um, in... Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, integration of schools under one condition, they don't in another, and then in another they don't actually fight actively against integration once it's introduced politically. So we haven't necessarily learned in that case uh, whether or not there is the same type of true misreport. What we've learned is that under some circumstances and in some conditions they will say one thing and in some conditions they will say another, and neither is necessarily quite the same um, uh, truth, if you will. So we looked at this before with the issue of concurrent validity. In essence, you could imagine a misreport here of reporting voting, where of those who report voting, uh, only 82% of those actually have a record of voting. Um, of those who report not voting, most of those people are telling the truth. At least 97%, they don't have a record of, of, of voting. Goodness only knows what happened to this extra 3% here. But again, that just says these people, we, we tend to call the people who report voting, but there's no record of voting. We call them having misreported voting. Um, what then can we think about as a source of misreports? Again, th thinking of misreports more is confined to the issue of behaviors, but at least potentially we could think of people as reporting one thing under one condition and another thing under a different condition as something of a misreport, um, at least a conditional misreport. So um, one, one factor could be sexual desirability um, or, again, demand characteristics if we want to think about it as within the experimental context, either sort of what people in general want or what the interviewer experimenter in particular wants in terms of how people report their behavior. Um, in, in some cases, people just forget. So, right, when we thought about the issue of crime reports earlier, people might have misreported the crime, but it was because they just forgotten minor crimes. And once given the chance to recall that, they did, in fact, remember this information. So the further away from the election, um, you are, like in the case of a general social survey, when you're asked two years after the election whether or not you voted or not, people might literally forget they've voted in lots of elections, don't remember exactly whether or not, you know, I had to stay at work late or I got there right after the polls closed or whoops, my kid got sick and I wasn't able to go that day. So you could imagine that people might have gotten involved in the election, voted in general, forgotten in one election, and therefore just not be able to recall that information. It turns out higher self-monitors tend to be far better at accurate reports. Um, interestingly enough, at least in some cases, people who are more concerned with social desirability are uh, less accurate um, with reports, particularly that's been shown with respect to voting turnout by a former student here at UMass. Um, stereotype threat can clearly cause misreports. So again, race of interviewer, gender interviewer can cause people to um, say things they might not otherwise say if you think about this as a contingent or conditional self-report. Um, keep in mind, though, that, of course, that even with these gold standard criterions, there can still be measurement issues, right? Lying on tax returns, uh, polls that inaccurately reported uh, voting turnout who lost records, or people who showed up to vote, but then their vote wasn't counted or got absentee votes to get lost in the mail. So you can imagine all sorts of reasons that even the gold standard criterion can be misleading when we think about misreports. Um, one thing that people have tried with respect to voting turnout, for example, 
is using question and response wording to reduce misreport. So you could imagine this type of question wording change being used to reduce misreport on many issues with social desirability attitudes. So in talking to people about elections, we find out people were able to vote because, and you give a list of reasons that are justifiable reasons for not voting. And it turns out that in addition, if you have to give alternative response options, I did not vote on November 5th. I thought about voting, but didn't. I usually vote, but I didn't this time um, versus I'm sure I voted. People become uh, much more likely to say, I thought about voting this time, but didn't. I usually vote, but didn't this time. So they have some way to signal the fact that in general they might vote, but in this specific time, right, they aren't. So you can imagine that part of the issue is when people ask, did you vote in the election, and you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm only one person, but I had this weird thing, but other people like me would vote. It's not exactly a misreport to say that you voted, right? So again, this type of question wording can help alleviate some of those concerns and get at um, underlying social desirability effects and also, um, again, demand characteristics. Uh, you can imagine it's very much like the way that we could change a one-sided question to a two-sided question in order to, to reduce acquiescence bias. Um, now, one does have to sort of think, though, carefully when you think about what does it mean to misreport an attitude when you find things like attitude, behavior, inconsistency. So saying that you support protecting the environment or you support the poor um, or intentioned by, in the case of some marketing surveys, uh, might not be the same as whether or not you actually make donations to the World Wildlife Foundation or you actually recycle or you actually make charitable donations. Um, so people might say they have a very negative attitude towards cheating and still be willing to cheat on an exam. Um, I mentioned before the issue that people who say they are quite prejudiced might still be willing to serve a minority in a restaurant. People, on the other hand, who say they aren't prejudiced might not be willing to. Right? So you often have this attitude, behavior, and consistency. Um, basically, there aren't good and easy ways on a survey to, to tease out uh, what is misreporting and what is contextual variation, uh, experimental design can help us through some of these issues. Now, there is a question of, um, one way we could think about misreporting or not attitudes is to think about if we ask the same question under the same conditions, would you get the same answer the next time around? Now, we have this problem, though, that basically the test, retest reliability on middle political, many political attitude measures, uh, almost everything besides partisan ID and racial attitudes, tend to be quite low. Um, even a correlation of 0.5 is actually fairly high for a political attitude. Um, specific policy attitudes, particularly around issues like foreign policy, tend to be the lowest, right? So whether or not um, you, um, especially lo basically lower salience policy attitudes, people tend to be more, they aren't sure which side they stand on, or at the very least they aren't sure how strongly they support something. Um, so in essence, one way you can think about what people are doing is they're going through the, in the sort of traditional receive accept the sample is there's not a true underlying attitude. What they're doing is they're sort of thinking through a bunch of different considerations and sort of whatever tends to be on the top of their head, um, whatever they tend to um, have thought of. And you might be basically getting polls from outside of a distribution. So you might be basically people might have a bunch of considerations that sort of push them to support a policy, but they just happened to have read a newspaper that article that day about how jobs programs actually harm lower income people. And then they think, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not in favor of this policy, even though in general, they might have a bunch of considerations that might support them to the policy. The thing that had triggered things that day didn't support them. One of the interesting uh, responses then is that you would expect that the more that people, um, knowledgeable and interested they are about politics, and in particular, in essence, the more they have screened out <laughs> sources of information that are contradictory, the more likely they are to be pulling from a consistent um, and, um, and not very d diverse, right, set of considerations. So you tend to find much higher reliability among higher interests, higher knowledge, and more partisan respondents. Now, we've gone through in this series of lectures a bunch of different effects that you can find. And it can leave you sort of feeling like, well, if we can't really measure a true attitude, it's not even clear what I'm asking. How could I ever design a good survey? So while there are no hard and fast rules, there are a few uh, tips that we can certainly share in thinking about um, survey design, or even, again, survey question design. If you're designing an experiment, you still are gonna need to ask some survey questions.
number one rule of thumb um, is that measure validation is critical. Therefore, what we tend to start with is pre-validated measures. So we basically, we don't want to design entirely new questions. We tend to want to start with what's already been done, what's there. It's, think of it as cumulative knowledge building. Um, if you have certain new questions or new, um, uh, even new treatments, if you're doing an experiment that you want to um, develop, using interviews, focus groups, um, pre-testing, piloting are all pretty important. Um, tools to, 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 to utilize. We'll be talking more about focus groups and interviews, but in essence what you're trying to do is get a sense of you as an interviewer have one view of the world. You want to understand how other people interpret your question. How would they respond to it? How is it that sort of social influence and social desirability and demand characteristics are going to creep into the answers to the questions and are they are you getting to measure the thing that you think you're going to measure, right? So think of this as, as face validity um, sort of taken to um, a, a large extreme. Another thing you have to think about is your response options. So usually having five to seven scales will tend to increase um, the stability and reliability of your question, five to seven point scales. Branch questions can also be quite useful. Um, you want to think about randomizing the response order when possible because you don't want just people choosing the first response. Um, you also want to be thinking about when you have scales, you don't want to always label all the points, but you want to at least use the endpoint and midpoint labels when you've got like a seven point scale. So like on an agree, disagree, and you often need to label the midpoint so they know what they're choosing. And you don't always want it to be don't know. You might want to be like neither agree nor disagree, right? Um, so that um, people know sort of where, in essence, you want them to interpret the scale in the same way. But the points in the middle are sort of you can leave a little bit more up for debate because in otherwise people will get too drawn in by those words on these sort of um, the points between these uh, the, the extremes and the exact midpoint. Um, another thing to be aware of, of course, are question and response order effects. Um, they usually aren't an issue, but you need to be alert, pre-test different orders, or at least discuss how different orders might work. Put sensitive or less obvious uh, questions first. So you want to have ones, if you are asking a bunch of questions about race, you want the more implicit, less obvious questions about race first um, before you ask people, like, are you a racist or not, right? You don't want to alert them that that's what the survey is actually about. Minimizing respondent burden, particularly online surveys, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and be alert to issues that we discussed in earlier lectures, like reference points, part whole issues and question wording, anchoring effects, right? All the types of um, question effects. As long as you're alert and aware of what's going on, there are better things. So if you're choosing sort of numerical quantities in your response options, as I said before, try to uh, conform to a somewhat normal distribution. Um, in how you're grouping these response options. There are also solutions to issues like social desirability, difficulty in recall, or acquiescence bias. You can think about alternative question or response wording. Um, be aware of balanced questions, so you want to avoid um, double-barreled questions, questions that in essence ask two questions at once. So you want to be careful in balanced questions that you've just given two sides of an issue, not address two different issues. Providing time for recall and sometimes even providing questions that aid in recall, as we talk, discussed in the crime victimization questions. Um, also, sometimes implicit or automatic attitude measures, which we haven't discussed a lot um, in this lecture, but that could be explored more in class time, can be incredibly useful for understanding and measuring um, issues that might be related to social desirability or acquiescence bias.